I want to tell you about a very lowly form of life, a slime mole. It is the present-day counterpart of the primordial ooze that appeared on Earth many, many eons ago. The descendant of this primordial ooze, the substance which gives life to all plants and animals, we call it protoplasm. Now let us go into the woods and collect the protoplasm of a slime mole. We shall probably find it growing on an old stump, such as this one. Or if the first stump reveals nothing, we'll search for another. And now here's better luck. Golden yellow protoplasm glistening in the sun. No shape to it, for it's always changing shape. No cells, no tissue, just protoplasm. One protoplasmic mass with many living nuclei. Having collected the protoplasm in nature, we can now grow it in the laboratory. Here is a culture of the slime mold Fissarum, growing so luxuriantly that it is crawled out of its culture dish. Note here this hanging thread of protoplasm on the left, with a mass of protoplasm on the end of it. It reveals the tensile strength of the living substance. And all the while, the protoplasm is flowing up and down in this living thread. Here we have a closer view of the culture. In the center is an island on which the food is placed. Slime molds are very fond of oatmeal. And surrounding the island is a moat of water. And here a still nearer view of a small part of the whole, such as we would see if we used a hand lens. Remember, this is not tissue, not an aggregation of cells, but just protoplasm. And through it all, there is constant streaming. And now the protoplasm is seen through the microscope. The movement never ceases as long as there is life, except during hibernation in wintertime. Here is a younger portion of the plasmodium. Could we but understand the cause of this constant movement, we should be nearer to an understanding of what life is. The protoplasm here flows all over the surface. Later, definite channels will be established. The granules which you see are nuclei, fat droplets, vacuoles, and bits of food. Here the plasmodium assumes its mature form, but now the arteries are transitory, and soon the whole picture will change. Note particularly the reversal in direction of flow, with a rhythmic period of 50 seconds. We shall now indulge in some work in microdissection. Here are several types of micromanipulators in which glass needles are clamped and controlled. Our problem is to prove that protoplasm is elastic. We prove it by tearing protoplasm with needles, just as a surgeon dissects the human body. And for this operation, we must have a pair of delicate needles made either in a tiny flame, such as this, or better yet, with the aid of a hot platinum wire. And now let us compare this microdissection needle with a good new sewing needle. We have all sorts of instruments for microdissection. Here is a double needle holder used as forceps. But we must get to work and tear the protoplasm to see if it holds together, or if it is simply a fluid like water. And for this purpose, we need a culture on a microscope slide, which becomes the roof of a small moist chamber with open ends, with the protoplasm on the inside. Here we are putting the needle into one of the open ends. 
and you will see the protoplasm on the underside of the roof of the moist chamber. We move the protoplasm aside for a moment in order to find the needle. And here it is. Now we are ready to dissect. And to prove how tough and elastic protoplasm is. We can not only dissect, but we inject with this delicate hypodermic needle, which is here merely blowing a bubble. Let us inject a toxic salt and you will see the protoplasm suddenly stop. Beyond, out of the picture, the protoplasm flows on as before. Thus the protoplasm meets contingencies, heals itself and thus saves itself. We turn now to a typical medical problem, anesthesia. When the normal protoplasm is treated with carbon dioxide, it slowly goes to sleep. Here is another specimen. Now it too is slowly going to sleep. And now a few minutes later we get the first indications of recovery. And a quarter of an hour later, almost the same culture back again. Healthy, normal protoplasm. And an hour later, we can't tell any difference between this protoplasm and that before anesthesia. Another specimen. It doesn't matter what I use to anesthetize protoplasm. Ether, chloroform, cold, or I can even hit it on the head with little droplets of water. There you just saw the normal reversal in this culture. But in this case, it is carbon dioxide. But now the gas is on. Watch it. So sudden a cessation of flow could occur only if the protoplasm has solidified. Here's still another patient under high magnification. We made a discovery that the rhythmic forces in protoplasm are even more basic than the flow. For when the protoplasm recovers, it doesn't just start flowing, it resumes as though it had been flowing all the while. In a moment now, the protoplasm slowly quiets down. Note that there is a slight nervous shock just before anesthesia takes place. Let me illustrate what I just said, that when the protoplasm recovers, it will be on the same curve. The rhythm has continued underneath, so to speak, even though the protoplasm has been asleep there is still something going on. We must be very close indeed to the question, what is life? The theory applies no matter what anesthetic agent is used. With the dentist's laughing gas, nitrous oxide, we also get a quick stop. And in time, full recovery. Anesthesia by electric shock is known, but never used on man. It is too dangerous. The electrical setup is a little complicated, for we must know voltage and amperage. The electrodes are of platinum wire, which are now being put into position. 30 volts are first administered, but the shock is insufficient. You see the electrodes coming into place. Now the upper one, and now the shock. Sixty volts produce complete anesthesia with little injury. You will note that there's no streaming anywhere now on the picture. But there's no permanent damage. You get full recovery a few moments later. Let us see what a higher voltage will do.
This isn't anesthesia, it's electrocution. I have done much work on toxicity, observing the effects of poisons. Here is what sulfur dioxide does to protoplasm. If anesthetic agents gelatinize protoplasm, stimulants should have the opposite effect, and so it proved. They liquefy protoplasm. The protoplasm here is literally pouring out into the surrounding medium, going into solution. All continuity in structure is lost, and of course that means death. Theobromin is a close relative of caffeine, a stimulant, and it too disintegrates protoplasm. As before, the slime mold is going into solution in the surrounding water. So you have two pictures. On the one hand, anesthesia and solidification. On the other hand, stimulation and liquefaction. As this curve depicts, normal protoplasm lies between the liquid and solid states. The solidification in anesthesia is not coagulation, for that would mean death. You cannot unclot blood, or as the chemists say, you can't unboil an egg. Anesthetized protoplasm gelatinizes and becomes quite firm. If the gelation goes too far, death by coagulation results. At the one end of the curve, we have liquefaction, and at the other end of the curve, solidification, which in both cases can result in death. In order to test the theory, I tried heroin, and this was a surprise. I'd always thought morphine and heroin to be depressants, and so I expected the protoplasm to gelate, to become firm. And when we saw this, we thought our theory would fall. Until we got hold of Goodman and Gilman and read some five pages telling us that the opium derivatives are stimulants, not depressants. So the reaction which you see here upheld my theory after all. An extraordinarily interesting problem is the fusion of two droplets of protoplasm. Now egg and sperm readily fuse, whereas two amoebae can crawl